Our shut-ins, we still want to, of course, remember Joyce Stidham, Raleigh Hindley, Clara Mosley, David and Becky Marshall, LaWanda Slayton, Diane Shelby, Jim Ham, Curtis Macklin. Remember these in your prayers uh, uh, and uh, in your uh, prayers as you go home. Um, the recipe and the cookbook, getting that together. So if you have one that you'd like to add, please get with Martha. Uh, men and women, your submissions are welcome. We extend our sympathy to Tim Meeks uh, on the passing of his mother, Jane Berry, this past week. Uh, services were this past week as well. Also to the Taylor family, on the passing of Annette this past week, services are tomorrow at Peebles Funeral Home in Somerville, viewing 12 to 2, and of course the service will be at 2 o'clock. This concludes our service. Let us begin with song. Concludes our announcements, not our service. We're just getting started. Yeah. Our song before the opening prayer is 126. 126. Live for Jesus. 126. Live for Jesus, oh my brother. His disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should be. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus. Give him all thou hast to give. On the cross, the world's redeemer gave his life so thou mightst live live for jesus wandering sinner under satan serve no more of the promise prize of winner thou mayst be when life is o'er live for jesus live for jesus give him all thou hast to give on the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live live for jesus in life's morning at the noon tide i be his and that eve when lay is turning and inherit endless bliss live for jesus live for jesus give him all thou hast to give on the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live would you bow with me please dear Heavenly father we thank you for this beautiful day we thank you for your many wonderful blessings we Thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we have, the freedom to come before you and study your word and sing these psalms. Lord, we pray that we will always have these freedoms, and that we will always look to you and look to your word throughout our daily lives, that we will allow you to guide us through life, that you will help us to reach out to the lost and dying world. We pray, Lord, that you will be with our country. We pray, Lord, you'll be with its leaders. Pray, Lord, that you will help them to make the right decisions, that you will help them to lead us closer to you instead of pushing us further away. Lord, we pray for our first responders. We pray for our military. We pray for those that are uh, putting their lives on the line on a daily basis, Lord. And we just pray that you will be with them and their families, that you will watch over them, and that you will bring them home safely. Lord, there are several in our hearts and minds that are sick. We just pray that you will be with them. That you will heal the doctors and nurses tending to them, that they might have a speedy recovery, should be thy will. Lord, we pray for those that have recently lost loved ones. Pray, Lord, that you'll uh, be with these families, that you will comfort them as only you can. 
Lord, we pray that you'll be with us throughout the remainder of this service. Pray, Lord, that everything that we do and say will be in accordance with your word. Forgive us for all our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Our psalm before the, the Lord's Supper will be 149. 149. Nearer, still nearer. One four nine. Near still near oh, still.
Before we give back a portion of our earnings, we'll sing the second verse of 149. 149, second verse. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring, not as an offering to Jesus my King, only my sinful Psalm before the lesson is 169, 169. Oh, how I love Jesus. One, six, nine. Mr. Convenient, would you please stand? There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in mine ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, Because he first loved me, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus 
because he first loved me. Be seated, please. Our invitation of song is number 17, 1 7. Good morning. I certainly hope everyone is well this morning, and it's good to be able to be back together. If you have your Bibles, be turned over to Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. This morning we're going to begin a short series of lessons calling inventory, Inventorying Yourself, if I can get it out there. And I think in the day and age we're living in, and certainly I think for children of God, that would be at any time, it's good to take a spiritual inventory. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you think we've talked before how important it is to think the right things because if we're thinking the right things we will do the right things but if we are not thinking the right things then that's going to lead to not doing what we need to do when we talk about so many within the scriptures the Apostle Paul for instance as we talked about this morning from 1 Corinthians 1 and we began looking at division as Paul addresses the problem of division and he spends four whole chapters he's going to in talking about not only the problem that exists but the cure for that problem the cure for that problem when you think on these things and you understand that there is a cure there's a cure for division and there's certainly that when we talk about taking an inventory and we find out that maybe things aren't what they should be. This morning from 1 Corinthians 1, we uh, talked about how we first have to recognize who we are. And secondly, Paul addresses understanding the blessings of God and understanding who God is and what God has done and what God is doing. And as children of God, when we recognize that, we can alleviate not only division, but we can alleviate the disagreements and the arguments that oftentimes seem to prevail and bring about division. And that's not good for the child of God. So how we get real peace is clear. It can only come through the real peacemaker, Jesus Christ. And when we talk about our relationship with God, we talk about the problems. Paul wants us to refrain in this life from the worldly point of view. And that's difficult. We all know in this day and age it's very difficult. With the pandemic and the unrest and things going on, there is a worldview. And sometimes that is in harmony, but not often, with that of God's view. And so much of the time when we see a lot of the sensationalism that is taking place, we become confused and rightly so we become angry and sometimes the anger is not put in the right direction or towards the right source and we throw our hands up sometimes as children of God saying well I just don't know how to act or how to react and the bottom line always will be the word love love and the other word I suppose would be respect and we can have that love and respect for one another we want the peace of God. And what Paul, I believe, is doing here is pushing us to find it. Pushing us to find it. How do we find it? Oftentimes we find it by changing our thinking. And as he pushes us here, the question is, are we willing to do the mental work that's oftentimes necessary to evaluate who we are, where we are, and where we're going <laughs> and, and if we've got the willingness to do that then we will certainly be able to have the peace of God uh, in this way so at the end we come to two verses <coughs> which we will ponder 
uh, here in the next few weeks. In verse 8, it's interesting how he ends with the phrase, think on these things. I think we'll all be in agreement that oftentimes the thinking ain't what it ought to be. And as I said before, if we're not thinking the way we should, then we're not doing what we should. Think on these things. First, not, verse 9 ends with practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Think on these things, practice these things. Hmm, sounds like a pretty good idea when it comes to the everyday life of a child of God. What are we thinking on? What are we thinking on? Sometimes our mind gets so cluttered with the things of the world, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, that God has been pushed out of our thinking. And if he's pushed out of our thinking, then he's pushed out of our lives. So the point is clear. If we get the, these things inventoried in our mind, we know that we will have a life of peace and not a world of chaos. And that's what we want. That's what we can have. But we can only have it if we think and we practice. It's like saying, I believe in something, but I'm not going to live by it. So we want to think on these things and we want to practice these things. Because the more we practice something, the better we get at it. Think about that. You may have something in your life that you've practiced. I've heard people say they would look at a great guitarist or a pianist. And they'd say, boy, I'd love to play the guitar like that person. Or I'd love to play the piano like that person. Really? Would you be willing to spend the hours of practice? Would you really just spend the time of your fingers just being absolutely numb, trying to develop the calluses on your fingers? Would you be willing to do all of that practice, practice? So as we practice what we're thinking on, as you practice these things, you're going to get better at it. It's like studying to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. As we study to show ourselves approved on, uh, unto God, we're going to get better at this stuff, folks. But the further we get away from God, the further or the closer we get to the world. That's why James said, submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Too many people just ain't resisting the devil, and they're fleeing from God. And the problems that we see today, a great deal of it, is because the devil is hard at it. And people are fleeing from God, and they're not resisting the devil. So it starts in your mind. That's number one. It starts in your mind. We've already said that, haven't we? We've got to think right to do right. Before we uh, look at a couple of the words in our text, Think about Paul's teaching here. His point is that until we think on higher, godlier things, we're going to find ourselves thinking about things that may not be so godly. We're going to find ourselves thinking on things that may not be helpful, and we may be building up an animosity that we ought not to be building up, even towards fellow Christians. Think on these things. Practice these things. What is Christ like? What does it mean to be Christ-like? I've got to know who Christ is. I've got to know what he's all about in order to develop a Christ-like attitude. So it starts with our mind. When you talk about Jesus, when you take the twelve up to Caesarea Philippi and ask them to think about who he was in comparison to what people say. You remember that in the gospel there where who, who do people say that I am? And there was a variety of answers that was given from prophets like Jeremiah or Elijah or John the Baptist. But it was Peter that spoke up as it was brought down to specifics when he said, yeah, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And every child of God, or every person for that matter, needs to answer the question, who is Christ to you? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter didn't always answer in the most correct way. He did here. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The next paragraph has Jesus talking about how he's going to have to be killed at the hands of the elders and chief priests. To which Peter took Jesus aside, if you can believe this, and we can, because it's in the Bible, took Jesus aside and rebuked Jesus. Not at the top of my list. And when you look back at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22. 
And be, uh, chapter 16, verse 22. Peter took him, began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of man. You and I, as children of the living God, have to decide whether we're savoring the things of God or the things of man. The things which are spiritual or the things which are physical. The temporary or the eternal. We have to determine that. This is what Jesus said. I, I want you to see again, verse 23, what Peter says uh, is a hindrance, a stumbling block. It's a powerful attack on Jesus. Peter certainly became very strong in, in service to Almighty God and in Christ Jesus, but he's the only one of that group that's ever been referred to really as Satan. I, you know, I, get thee behind me, Satan. Boy, that's some harsh language there. The way you think, the way you frame the circumstances you're in are either based upon Satan's desires or God's desires. Make sure you're looking at situations through the right glass. Make sure you got your right glasses on and you're looking at it through God and not through Satan and the world. When Paul has us inventory our mind, when he calls upon us to think on these things. Paul knows exactly what the outcome will be if we don't. Did you hear me? Paul knows exactly the outcome if we don't think on these things. Now I know everybody's not going to be honest and pure. And I, I know everybody's not going to do that in the world. I know they don't even all do that in the church. That's why when some come up to me and say, well, you're the folks that think you're the only ones going to heaven. I'm very quick to say, listen, I think there's a lot of our folks that are going to have a hard time making it. So, no, I don't think we're the only ones going to heaven. I think the church is because that's what the Bible says. And so in understanding what the church is, is to understand who's going to inhabit the kingdom of heaven. So inventory. You have to decide. Much of the spiritual war we fight has a basis in our mind. Our mind affects the words we say and the emotions that rise to the top. And sometimes we can get very vocal and very emotional about what we believe and where we stand. How we see others, even how we view God. So as we get into these lessons, I hope that You'll understand and you'll see the value that Paul or God here, frankly, is asking us to do some self-reflection. But more importantly, helping us to see how we can have a life of peace that so many of us desperately want. Secondly, he talks about the phrase, that which is true. So Paul begins the inventory with whatever is true. Whatever is true. Boy, is, isn't that a hard thing to determine today in the world? What is true? What is truth? What is correct? Getting pulled in all different directions. Paul's teaching that we fill our minds with that which is true. So that truth becomes our nature. I can't be responsible for what you do or you for what I do. But we can work on ourselves, and that's the idea of a spiritual inventory. And when I build up the idea of true or truth, and that's a part of an integral part of my life, then it becomes my nature. The word's a little different than truth, though. In the same, uh, this word centers upon that which is real, authentic, or genuine. So it's a little different than what we normally associate with the word truth. Real, genuine. Authentic. Children see through oftentimes those things quicker sometimes than adults of what is real and what's genuine and what's authentic and what's fake. In John 6, Jesus calls his flesh true food 
and his blood true drink. They couldn't handle that talk and everyone seems to leave him. What makes the flesh and blood of Jesus real, true, authentic? You see, when Jesus is a part of our life, we see what's true, what's real, and what's authentic. We see the body. We see the blood. We see the sacrifice. Paul was in chains, yet the letter that we look at centers on that which is positive. Isn't that interesting? That even with what's going on, even with him being in change, even with the idea, of, you're still positive about all this, Paul? Yeah, he is. When you think about a person or situation, ask yourself this question. Is what I'm thinking true? Or is it a preconceived idea? People tend to go the direction of what agrees with them. And when we go the direction of what agrees with us, then it may not necessarily be true. It may be something that just agrees with us. And since we like that a whole lot, that must be the truth. And we look no further. We examine nothing any further. And we never really find what is true. Sometimes we hold on to anger much longer than is healthy. Why? Because we play out the story in our head over and over again. We become the judge. And every time we play that out in our head over and over again, we're the judge and, and we win every time. So we get angrier and we get angrier because I'm right, you're wrong. But is that true? Is your thinking the reality of the situation or is it just simply your perception of that person? When I think on things that are not true, I understand. I need to see what is real. Thirdly and finally, that which is honorable or noble. The next phrase Paul uses is that which is honorable. The two words used in most translations are honorable or noble. But do those words really mean much to you? When Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, he uses this word when talking about older men, deacons and women. But when we translate the word, we often use the phrase worthy of respect. It's a word that carries the idea of reverence. And I think we'll all agree that that's some of the problems that we're seeing today, a lack of respect. A lack of reverence for, for God and a lack of respect for one another. And we've seen the end results of that. I've got to be careful not to fill my mind with things that are spiritually unhealthy for me. I want to think on things that are from above, not on things below. So as you think on these things this morning, as we walk through these words over the next few weeks, the challenge is to do more than to just gain information. Remember, think, practice. That's what we're going to do. If you're here this morning 